think we can learn a lot from the SaaS market, particularly their focus on churn, because we're trying to retain customers as managed services providers. Luke Diaz is the founder of DBT Ventures, standing for Do Big Things, which has an amazing portfolio of angel and venture investments and advises some tech, software, and other innovations. And he's an expert in customer success and SaaS trends. And he's helped three startups grow from single digit millions to over $100 million in ARR. And he joins me on this bonus episode of The Business of Tech. Today's episode is supported by CoreView. Your customers need your Microsoft 365 expertise, and CoreView has the only M365 management platform designed for MSPs. Manage hundreds of tenants, automate manual tasks, and monitor compliance, all while intelligently comparing to the baseline. With a no-code control approach, CoreView revolutionizes your Microsoft 365 administration. This powerful platform enables automatic reporting and remediation, ensuring optimal performance and security. The best part? You achieve this high level of service without the need for a large workforce, allowing you to focus on growing your business through efficiency. Want to know more? Visit coreview.com slash MSP and find out more. Luke, thanks for joining me today. Big fan of the show. Thank you so much, Dave, for having me. So, Luke, you've been involved in scaling a bunch of different startups to over $100 million in ARR. Give me your lay of the land on sort of SaaS and where you see it heading in the next couple of years. That's a great question. Uh, It's definitely a a dynamic environment right now. As a functional leader in customer success and having grown go-to-market organizations, we've seen a lot of retraction when it comes to the, the market cycle. Thankfully, some of that inflation pressure has subsided a little bit, but we still are having regular conversations. Um, and, and I've heard this a lot from peers over the last couple of years that CFOs are definitely prioritizing cash flow, free cash flow and efficiency over the growth at all costs narrative that we've, we've now realized is uh, unsustainable. So what I am seeing is uh, continued growth in SaaS, but at much more conservative estimates in the uh, 10 to 20% range over the next uh, over the next year, year and a half, as the continued price pressure comes in um, upon renewal time uh, for like, what have you done for me recently in getting more um, just this overall theme of uh, scrutiny when it comes to getting the, the most bang for your buck from your software spend. And it's interesting you bring that up because if, if we're slowing a little bit and we're having a little less explosive growth, and that's, by the way, a healthy as a, as a market matures, mm-hmm. that makes churn and retention really important. And what a colleague of mine once would describe that like the key to SaaS is not as much the sign up. It's actually keeping people from leave, from leaving. And, and recently on, on churn FM, you discussed a bunch of churn and retention challenges. So what are the approach, the kind of innovative approaches you've seen companies take to improve their renewal rates? And does that link over to, to fundraising? It, it certainly is connected to fundraising. Uh, from the VC community that I work within and, and talk to, uh, they're looking for retention rates in the high 80s, if not the, the, the low 90s, to even consider uh, writing a check. Um, so to your point, a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of creative marketers that can get, uh, and, and sales teams that can get a customer in. But if you're not delivering that value, uh, they're much less interested in the sustainable unit economics of the business. And so to your point, there's a direct, uh, correlation to fundraising and efficacy, all rooted in the, the basic unit economics. To the first part of your question, the, the renewal tactics that I found most novel, I mean, it, it really depends if, if the company or the managed service provider is targeting like really big, large enterprises, or if they're operating more of a, a smaller ACV, longer tail, more of a scale motion. What I found has been really uh, clever for the latter, where there's lots of customers paying a smaller amount, is you can build these... Um, you can build these automated renewal flows that make engaging with you either, either as a managed service provider or as a SaaS software company 
uh, much more user friendly. Uh, I, a couple of years ago, I built a fully automated DocuSign renew your contract with a few clicks. They didn't want to have, you know, you didn't want, they didn't have to talk to sales. They didn't have to renegotiate everything. They didn't have to deal with contracts. And so there's some really elegant ways nowadays using technology. Uh, this was a DocuSign Apex Salesforce, uh, workflow. And then, uh, with email communications guided by HubSpot. I don't know if this is too tactical, but the, the key is you made that renewal process much more streamlined and, uh, less, less human intervention. So it's, we saw a nice uptick there just because the process and the experience was much more, um, was much better. Now, you're an expert in customer success. So I, I want to dive in there a little bit. Like, what are the, where do you see this going? Where does that function evolve next to? And, and what do companies need to implement to accelerate and keep those people, you know, to drive impact and drive business, accelerate their growth and retain everybody in customer success? That's a great question, um, Dave. I've been thinking about that a lot as the role has been changing in kind of like the spirit of customer success and what does it mean? There continues to be many flavors of customer success. You have, on one side, you have very revenue driven, almost like I might say uh, wolves in sheep's clothing, where it's really account management and they're focused first and foremost on dollars and uh, retaining the dollars, sure, but also expanding and selling into the the customer base. And I'm actually seeing that flavor of customer success uh, go down fairly dramatically because what I'm seeing is a pendulum shift from what I might call account management and revenue to value creation and, and driving business outcomes to set up the renewal and the expansion for success. Because if you don't do the value in that, that free work, uh, you're fighting an uphill, somewhat Sisyphean battle. So wh- that's one of the biggest shifts I've seen is that shift towards away from rev- purely revenue driven outcomes to more the, the value creation for the customer to make sure that they're getting the ROI from their spend. The other thing that I've seen, perhaps that what's made it harder to hire for is the, the expected data skills of the CSM. As more and more vert- vertical SaaS products and even man- some of the managed services around them uh, become more and more data intensive, there's become this expectation and a need for customer success teams to be data ninjas and be very comfortable with SQL leverage AI and chat generative AI tools like chat TPT, uh, all in service of adding value for their customer. So that's been a second trend that I've been keeping a close eye on and updating my hiring profiles for, uh, to build some really world-class teams. Well, so you brought it up first. I knew I was about to go there. Uh, and you you were actually recently wrote an article about explore and explored the use of chat GPT and customer success. Like, how do you envision these tools? Kind of transforming customer success and how is it practical to apply it? You know, the, I wrote the article on LinkedIn just to kind of give other customer success and go to market leaders, um, an entry point because I think we can all create a GPT chat GPT account and like ask it to, uh, Dolly to create an image or ask some questions about this and that. But how do you systematically integrate it into your workflows? to actually create customer success efficiency. I feel like that's where the, I feel like we've explored a lot of the low hanging fruit and now we're trying to climb up that tree and get to some of the meatier, uh, more impactful things. I've been really impressed with chat GPTs and, and other LLM models approach to uh, data analysis. I think the days of customer success managers reading a 10 K or getting really deep, into the financials of a company, I think that that's going to be upload turnkey. Here's a summary and some next steps to, to talk about. So I, I see tremendous cost savings um, in terms of efficiency of the consumption of information 
in turn, and also uh, content creation. Customer success managers spend hours and hours, on average, about six to eight hours a week, just building decks and content. We were right now that you're starting to see these pipelines or these API flows where like these LLMs can populate different formats very effectively so that you're not starting from scratch. You're, you, you literally have a 80 to 90% built deck for your next QBR um, using a fine tuned LLM. And that gets me really excited uh, for the next phase of this. So it sounds like, and I want to kind of validate the premise a little bit. You're mm -hmm. definitely bought into the idea of, of, you know, Microsoft's terminology of a co-pilot. So it's a mm -hmm. data analysis tool. It's an assistant helping the CSM versus some people that have talked about the idea of using them as chat agents and interacting with customers. Give me a little sense of where you fall on that. The, the pricing and the value of, for example, Microsoft's co-pilot is an interesting jump off point. Because if you look at the base 365 license compared to Microsoft All AI Copilot, it's actually 6x as, as expensive as the base 365. Do I think generative AI is going to make all humans six times as effective? No, I, I don't. I think that's, I think that's wildly optimistic in the short term. And I think there's some corner cases where you could make the counter argument with some of the code and some of the the more direct, tangible output of like uh, engineers, for example. I have seen some 10x use cases, but for the typical knowledge worker that's working with Slack and talking to customers and trying to close deals, I work mostly on the go-to-market side. I do think the 6x price point is 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 very uh, is very optimistic in at least looking out at. 2024. Um, I do see, I, I actually, I think to answer your question more succinctly, I see generative AI replacing whole parts of the customer success and go-to-market workflows, not only being, you know, the proverbial uh, co-pilot on your shoulder that's helping you throughout the day. I actually see it as a replacement, like replacing a large parts of the function. Um, over the next one to one and a half years. Interesting. So, so like, I mean, do you think that's like a reduction in force or an expansion of capabilities? Both like, what does it mean for the people in customer success? I think if you're thinking about like a large, like enterprise customer success, you'll never replace the cut, the relationship building facet of like humans like to talk to humans, build rapport, uh, they like to laugh. They like to talk about numbers. They like to share stories. I don't think the social animal within all of us is going away. Um, so I still see relationship building as being like the, um, one of the things that customer success and go to market does that's not replaceable, uh, by, by generative AI. But a lot of the content creation and especially for like the long tail for customers manning managing thousands of smaller accounts. That's where I see it having the biggest impact to where it's not a heavy investment of relationship capital, but this is where, you know, the chat bots, the automated workflows, and even some of the automated product feedback loops we're starting to see. That's where I see just the efficiency go sky high. And you might, you know, you might have one CSM that can feasibly manage 300 plus accounts. Um, I'm I'm already seeing it, but that's not the enterprise. That's more of like this SMB mid market scale where you can't afford to hire an army to take care of a smaller tranche of revenue. Well, that's where a lot of my listeners live, so this could be encouraging news. Mm -hmm. um, help me. Out. The other thing you've written about that I was interested in is you you've talked about building churn prediction models with machine learning. Can you give me a little a little sense, like elaborate on how those work and how they can be leveraged to improve outcomes? Yeah, I think that was a really, if, if I recall, I think you're referring to a, a, um, a churn prediction score we built uh, mm -hmm. to basically help us understand more objectively, like where is the churn risk in the portfolio? And at the highest level, we just fed um, a machine learning model, a ton of data, and we actually did a horse race between different approaches to machine learning. Uh, it was random forest 
was one type of model. And we, we did kind of a horse race versus XG boost, which is another, um, kind of like Kegel prize winning machine learning model. And all of that's to say, we're trying to find the best model that is the most predictive. And, um, it was very successful. We saved hundreds of thousands of dollars because we now had a, uh, a machine learning approach to like, where is the risk in the portfolio? And we trained, we trained the models off, I think about 400 renewals and, um, uh, a hundred or so, tr- like basically a large, uh, universe of renewals that were either successful or unsuccessful. I think the key thing, and maybe to your audience, this, that might be useful is whenever you, in, uh, whenever you introduce a new score or a new metric, especially if it has machine learning or AI, there's like this black box fear of the unknown. And the team might be like, I don't know if I trust this thing. Um, so what I might suggest is these churn prediction scores can be really useful to almost like nominate, like put, put a red flag in the air, be like, Hey, there might be some risk here. So that the, if, if you do have, um, customer success managers or humans that are in charge of this, they don't feel that their job's being encroached upon, but rather, hey, this is actually trying to help me find where the fires are that I might I might not have seen the smoke yet. And that's where machine learning is so powerful because it can take 300 data points, look for patterns and say, hey, this account that you actually think is really healthy actually exhibits behaviors and attributes that is a lot like this universe that churn. Maybe you should investigate here. And I, I love that where it's like kind of that one, two punch of AI humanity uh, trying to make customers successful versus like just top down. Hey, this is the new way we think about risk. I, I, I had more success with it suggesting the risk and that it was more, it was better adopted by the team that way. That's what actually what I was hoping you were going to say, actually. So I'm, gl- I'm glad I validated <laughs> that way. Well, I asked because I, because I don't know, but it seemed like a parallel to some of the work that they're doing with AI and machine learning models on, you know, compounds for, for pharmaceutical testing. And it mm-hmm. felt like that, that it was suggesting things to go test as higher priorities. And it felt like it might be that. So I'm encouraged to hear that that actually parallel does exist in mm-hmm. what we're seeing with sort of customer success data. I think that's a great parallel of like, yeah, looking through vast expanses of data and then suggesting some really interesting molecular patterns or in this case, churn attributes. I think that's a novel uh, comparison. So if I, I want to end on something really actionable, particularly for somebody who may not be as familiar with customer success. Like if you were, if you were working with somebody that says, I really want to do a better job helping my customers be successful as, as my, you know, customer. What is kind of one of those one thing you always look for in a, in a in an emerging customer success org that's like a key indicator of success? The number one trait that I look for in customer success uh, individuals or or in fact, like the team as a whole is their level of curiosity. Specifically, the skill of discovery is my favorite customer success uh, trait or skill because the more that you are willing to just stop talking and listen, I feel like customers want to tell you their story and where they're struggling. And they're only able to do that. If you ask really good questions, guide them down that path and they'll literally show you the treasure map. And then the customer success function can, can encode all that feed it back to product engineering. And then all of a sudden you have a hundred million dollar SaaS company. So I look for like, I'll, I'll just pound the table on curiosity and the skill of discovery, which is, is one of the most highest leverage training enablement activities I've done and has just yielded incredible outcomes uh, for go to market teams across the board. Well, that's encouraging because that one can't be replaced by AI. So, so this, is, this is good news. Look, if people were interested in learning more, what's a, a great set of resources to, to reach out and be in touch? You know, if there's any book, bookworms out there that, that want to look at some book summaries, um, I publish, uh, I try and read uh, a book or two a month 
then publish uh, some book notes on uh, dbtventures.com. Uh, that's Delta Bravo Tango. It stands for Do Big Things. Anyway, dbtventures.com, and there's a library there where you can check out some free book summaries if you're inclined. Um, otherwise, I, I try and share some thoughts uh, every week or so on LinkedIn, uh, where I think you found that ChatGPT article. So cool. uh, just Luke, Luke R. Diaz on uh, LinkedIn. Awesome. Luke, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you joining me today. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks for having me. It's been an honor. This episode sponsored by Skykick, new sponsor for MSP Radio. Skykick has been helping over 30,000 MSPs for the past 10 years be more successful in the cloud, migrating, protecting, securing, and managing their Microsoft 365 customers. A highlight in their offerings is their Microsoft 365 data protection solution, Cloud Backup. They've recently enhanced it with a new feature called Smart Insights. This feature delivers visual insights, empowering partners to engage more efficiently with customers on Microsoft 365 data protection. And MSP Radio listeners get a special offer. Get a free 2M365 email migration for a customer when you bundle it with backup. Visit skykick.com slash MSP Radio to learn details. The Business of Tech is written by me, Dave Sobel, under ethics guidelines posted at businessof.tech. This episode was edited and produced by Picture This Video. If you like the content, please make sure to hit that like button and follow and subscribe. It's the free and easy way to support the show and help us grow. You can also check out our Patreon, where you can join the Business of Tech community at patreon.com slash MSP Radio, or buy our Why Do We Care merch at businessof.tech. Finally, if you're interested in advertising on the show, visit mspradio.com slash engage. Thanks for listening today, and I will talk to you again on the next episode of the Business of Tech. Part of the MSP Radio Network.